Hello, and welcome to Nothing About Us Without Us, SGM's theory, research ethics, and history for the LGBTQ health course in the summer quarter of 2023 within the Northwestern Feinberg School of Medicine's Program for Public Health. I am Lauren Beach. I use they, them pronouns, and I'm an assistant professor within the Department of Medical Social Sciences and the Institute for Sexual and Gender Minority Health and Wellbeing within Feinberg. So a bit about an overview for today's lecture. So we will be discussing key theories informing the study of sexual and gender minority health. We will be discussing LGBTQIA plus research ethics, and we will have at the end a very brief overview of LGBTQIA plus histories um, and a review of how this all connects to, again, uh, research ethics and the medical model and how ultimately we have a duty to engage in viewing SGM health, not only in terms of a lens of knowledge or content expertise um, domains, but also in terms of being a real life practice and praxis that is, that I would say an ethical frame and a critical reading of LGBTQI health demands us to take action to improve equity in this area. So in brief, there are a variety of theories that have really come to be key that inform the conduct of sexual and gender minority health research. These include stigma as a fundamental social determinant of health, the socioecological model, minority stress theory, intersectionality, and other, other critical frameworks. And then finally, there are a number of studies that have sought to synthesize these and other models to inform the planning and conduct of SGM health research. So first of all, um, what is stigma? So stigma at its core comes from a sociological frame or body of work. Probably the most famous foundational text that deals with stigma was written by Irving Goffman, and it, you can see the cover here. Stigma, notes on the management of a spoiled identity. So what does Goffman mean by a spoiled identity? Well, um, he really conceptualized stigma as something that was not possible to define without defining normality. And normality, you can think of as, as coming to represent the socially dominant group for any sort of identity set of categories. So for the example of sexual orientation, you might be thinking of heterosexual people as forming the dominant group. The dominant group is positioned as having that normal identity. And anyone who isn't heterosexual, in contrast, would have what Goffman would call a spoiled identity, meaning, um, well, you started off, everyone assumed you might be heterosexual, but then um, when you come out as something other than heterosexual, like, for example, bisexual, lesbian, gay, et cetera, then that identity that used to be normal is now spoiled because the other identity that you come out as having is stigmatized. It's important to note that in that example, I gave what might be often considered an invisible stigmatized identity, which is on the basis of sexual orientation, but both visible and invisible traits are stigmatized. A classic example of a visible trait that might be stigmatized is race. Um, and so that is something that oftentimes people, again, it's not proper, but people will assume somebody's race by looking at them. Um, that's less common for sexual orientation, although there are efforts that people can take to try to represent their sexual orientation to be seen. Um, some notes on this, when a stigmatized trait is invisible, it can be hard to convince people um, without the trait that it is stigmatized. An example here might be invisible disability. Um, so like mental health diagnoses, for example. Um, might be an example of something that people can't tell by looking at someone and they might say, oh, well, just snap out of it, <laughs> um, which would be a classic example of, you know, somebody who might not have a mental health condition um, saying something to somebody who does to say like, okay, well, I don't see that this is really a problem for me, so why can't you snap out of it? Um, that would be an example of mental health stigma. Um, core elements of stigma in terms of how it operates include blame, shame, and discrimination. And those things together um, help spell out what stigma can look like. It's also important to realize that there are different categories of stigma. So I already mentioned discrimination. I think the classic example of discrimination is being fired from your job or turned, passed over for promotion because of having a stigmatized trait. Um, 
there's also, in addition to that, um, other interpersonal forms of stigma. So perceived or felt stigma, anticipated stigma um, is something that can affect folks who know that they're part of a minoritized group. Um, and they're always wondering, like, did this person treat me poorly, perhaps because of who I am? Um, and they don't know, and that, you know, are they worried that that might happen? And that's an example of anticipated stigma. Internalized stigma would be believing the, um, the fears, like the, the stigmatizing um, aspects that people, uh, like the spoiled part of the identity, if you will, from Goffin's work, um, you know, believing that they are in fact spoiled or believing there's something wrong with them versus believing that this is the wrong, the thing that's wrong is the existence of the stigma against people like them is what's wrong. So if you internalize the, the stigma itself, that's, that's in the self level for stigma. There's also at the top of this um, structural stigma, and it's a little bit, so structural stigma you could think of as um, being reflected in social norms and, and attitudes against people from minoritized groups um, or stigmatized groups. You could think of it um, as that being reflected in laws and policies. Um, you sometimes might see that laws would be passed that result in um, fewer opportunities for people to access healthcare. For example, in the case of transgender youth, a variety of states have recently passed laws to try to limit transgender youth and in some cases adults access to healthcare for gender affirming care. That would be an example of stigma at a structural level because of that being enacted within laws and impacting health systems. Um, you also see at the bottom of this list concealment, which is called a stigma adjacent construct. And that's because disclosure and concealment for invisible stigmatized traits, which would include things like I said, like homophobia, biphobia, transphobia are examples of stigma that might fall against um, sexual orientation, which is often an invisible trait that when you choose, to, if and when people are coming out, um, they are taking their invisible stigma to a known type of stigma, you know, that a known type of stigma might apply to them as part of a sexual minority group in society. Um, but then they can decide if and when to control that with either trying to conceal their sexual minority identity or to disclose it to others. Um, so it's just important to think about how stigma manifests at different levels and how that that is a unique, there's a unique aspect of that in particular of sexual orientation and gender identity when it comes to disclosure concealment. So why did we have all of this conversation about stigma? Um, that is because of one of the main driving forces in sexual and gender minority health research has been this recognition that stigma itself is a fundamental social determinant of health. And that we know that social determinants of health are broadly linked to health inequities. So here I'm showing a figure that was created by Dr. Mark Katzenbuehler, look at showing how stigma at the interpersonal and structural levels would in turn contribute to um, stigma at the self level and that how stigma on all levels contributes to effects on social determinants of health. And here the emphasis is on socioeconomic status as a social determinant of health. So education, housing, healthcare access, food security. If you're fired from your job for being transgender, for example, then you can see how the loss of income is also linked in this country to the loss of healthcare in many cases and those losing those things, you can see that how housing and food security might be, um, you know, cascade, there's a cascade that also limits access to those things when you don't have healthcare or income. Um, and we know that when you don't have the basics needed to live a healthy life, uh, that there's a lot of stress that comes from that. And then the stress as well as the lack of access to things that are going to allow you to eat a healthy diet, exercise, um, ex you know, manage stress without substance use, for example, all of those things are harder to attain. And that com combined leads to broad range ranging health inequities of minoritized and stigmatized groups. So stigma often is at the core and the roots of a lot of the causes that are tied to why people are not able to live a healthy lifestyle or how stress, high stress levels might affect health. So inherent in that discussion as I was having about the levels of, cis, of stigma, you can see why um, in a sexual and gender minority health research, the sociological model is really often used because um, the sociological model itself, which was created by um, Dr. Bronfenbrenner, 
back in the 1970s um, is just showing that the world is a series of levels and systems that influence each other from the individual all the way up to the macro system. Um, I think that in the context of SGM health research, often the levels that get focused on aren't so much every level that Bronfenbrenner defined in the initial articulation of the socio-ecological theory. Instead, we often focus in on individual level, health system level, you know, individual, sorry, interpersonal health system level, and then kind of social and structural level um, to map on to how stigma and resilience promoting factors that would be things that fight back against the negative effects of stigma on health, resilience promoting factors um, would have an exerting a, or kind of an opposite effect on health, like social support, which you can see access to social support and services, for example, in this model. Um, that's kind of more the level of, you know, four, three or four levels are articulated. And then not only do we look at uh, increasingly visualize stigma, but we visualize the factors that push back against stigma, because it's important that um, although stigma cuts across multiple levels, it's a modifiable construct. Like we can, through social action and education and other direct action tactics, I would argue, um, push back against the forces of stigma that have a negative health effect to build community, to fight back, to promote resilience. Um, and we can, just like we can do that, um, like resilience promoting factors, just like the stigma levels, there are multiple levels for resilience promoting factors that can take place at those same um, locations. So um, one thing that you might have also noticed when I was talking about the different levels for stigma, as particularly from Dr. Mark Hatzenbuehler's work in structural stigma, uh, is the tying of stigma to social determinants of health and to stress and, I, and connecting stress to health effects. And so that really comes into the minority stress model. So not only are we looking at how multiple levels that stigma operates and how resilience promoting factors might operate, we're also looking at how these operations together might affect health. So um, Virginia Brooks published an initial sexual minority stress theory uh, articulation in 1981. And you can see an uh, article here remembering her work that was authored by Drs. Rich, Sawe, Shaim, and Poteet. Um, the reason they authored this work about um, the Brooks model of minority stress is because another model published by Dr. Elon Meyer in 2003 has been the paper, you know, over 20 years later, that has been heavily cited almost 15,000 times and counting to articulate minority stress in the context of sexual minority health in particular with this model. Um, and this model, if you go back and forth between the, the uh, Brooks model and the Meyer model, you can see that um, the Meyer model tends to be, while well, there is mention of how circumstances in the environment, i.e. stigma, um, would be leading people to understand that they have a, a spoiled identity or a minority status on the basis of sexual orientation, race, gender, et cetera. Um, and then linking that to distal and prox proximal stressors. Um, and then finally linking all of that to mental health outcomes. And then with modifiers, including coping and social support or like what I might call a resilience promoting factor. Um, and then having the psychological emphasis on like how, what people's identities mean to them. Um, you can see how that operates in this model, and it's really focused in on mental health outcomes in particular. Brooks' model is a bit broader, um, and I think more sociological than um, the Meyer model is in terms, which is more psychological in its origins. But um, I just wanted to make people aware of these theories that connect very simply having a minoritized identity to being stressed at other people's reactions <laughs> uh, to having this stigmatized identity and that how the extra stress has wear and tear effects and gets under the skin and the body um, to have, in this case, poor mental health outcomes or in the case of the model that was articulated by um, David Lick and colleagues, you know, expanding the minority stress model for sexual minorities into physical health disparities. Um, with this pipe paper. And it's also important to note that the minority stress model concept has been expanded into gender minority stress. So taking something that um, was previously only focused on sexual minority stress and making it into gender minority stress and in, in highlighting some of the specific distal and proximal stressors. 
as well as resilience promoting factors that affect mental and physical health outcomes within transgender populations. Um, and so that really takes us through stigma as a fundamental social determinant of health through minority stress and the sociological model. So now, um, one thing I wanted to really make sure to highlight is how critical frames are important. And the one I wanted to emphasize today is intersectionality. So why do I call intersectionality a critical framework? Um, really, it's because the origins for intersectionality I talked about previously, like for some of these other theories, it was psychology or sociology. For intersectionality, it is feminist thought, in particular, Black feminist, um, it's a Black feminist discipline, like intersectionality arises out of that space. And so um, what I'm showing here is a series of pictures on the screen. So on the far left uh, is Sojourner Truth. And then I'm showing a pamphlet, the Combahee River Collective Statement, Black feminist organizing in the 70s and 80s. And then on the far um, right here, I'm showing Dr. Patricia Kill Collins and uh, Dr. Kimberly, or sorry, Kimberly Crenshaw, who's an attorney. Um, and so all of this, like the origins of intersectionality comes from really black women. Um, and what intersectionality has as its core as it articulates is that um, when we think about stigma, you can't really think one issue at a time. So one thing that I wanted to go back to with Meyer's model here, minority status, yes, there are multiple types of ways that minority status is defined. So sexual orientation, race, ethnicity, gender. Um, that what intersectionality would say is that the, all of these things are co-occurring at the same time in the person level. So it would say um, with Kimberly Kent Crenshaw's work, which was done in the legal journal context uh, at first, you know, she describes in her work that when the law only protects people on the basis of race as one set of case law and on the basis of sex as another set of case law, that you are not protecting black women in particular because they're discriminated in, um, in the workplace, for example, simultaneously at the intersections of their sex and race. And that when the law is informed specifically to protect not just one thing and the other thing in terms of different identities or different tracks um, that protect, you know, prohibit discrimination, that you have this missing space in the middle where black women exist. Um, and that's what a lot of these early intersectional writings have been about. Um, and it's important to note that, you know, that uh, this frame has been applied to public health writ broadly, and in particular through that lens to sexual and gender minority health. And the next person whose work I really wanted to highlight is Dr. Lisa Boleg, um, because she has taken this concept of intersectionality from the Black feminist frame from which it originated and put it into the discipline of public health. And so, um, she has written many, many papers that have been um, applied intersectionality as a research frame to conduct sexual and gender minority health research. Um, one thing I really liked was this metaphor, once you've blended the cake, you can't take the parts back to the main ingredients, Black, gay, and bisexual men's descriptions and experiences of intersectionality. I think this really makes that point strongly that um, intersectionality means that the focus is on all of these things at the same time, like in terms of you can't disarticulate a person's blackness from a person's, you know, sexual orientation is gay, for example, like the experience of being a black gay man or a black bisexual man um, is like the cake instead of here is an ingredient of any one identity at a time. Um, you can't really disarticulate these things and make any sense. You don't look at a set of ingredients and think, wow, what a lovely cake. That's just not how it works. Um, so I recommend that paper as well as the paper, the problem with the phrase women and minorities um, from Dr. Boleg, if you're looking to really get started and dig in more deeply about understanding intersectionality in a public health context. Um, this is probably the single most succinct and accurate definition that I have seen for intersectionality in public health, again, from Dr. Boleg. Um, so she defines it as a theoretical framework that posits that multiple social categories at the individual micro level um, reflect multiple interlocking systems of privilege and oppression at the macro level or structural level. And so what this means, and when you're doing public health research, for example, is that the interlocking systems of privilege and oppression that a person experiences 
um, do so what that means is like how racism, sexism, heterosexism, for example, might be impacting black lesbian women. Um, the the stigma itself that attaches to the identities and not the identities itself is what sets intersectionality apart from just general epidemiology, if you will. Because many people, they think that they make the mistake of um, what is what Dr. Boleg calls the flattening of intersectionality. They think that intersectionality is only the micro level part that they are doing intersectional research simply by saying, well, I created a double reference group, for example, uh, that co-constructs sex and race at the same time, or that co-constructs um, sex and race and sexual orientation. You know, I might have 16 categories where I'm looking um, at Black gay men, Black bisexual men, um, Black lesbian women, et cetera, like go through all these different categories and then see what a certain outcome, like a mental health outcome or like a cardiovascular outcome might look like. Um, and they think, okay, that's intersectionality. But it's actually not because it did not take into account the second part to um, Dr. Boleg's definition here, which it did not connect the micro level identities to the social systems of privilege, power, and oppression at that macro level to understand how the social context in which people are living um, is affecting their health outcomes. And so it's another way to think of it is it's it's intersectional racism um, at this, that, and not just um, race and sexual orientation that is responsible via stigma as a fundamental social determinant of health, for example, um, for health disparities that would be attaching to multiply minoritized groups of people. Um, if you do not have that second part that interrogates systems of power and how they affect the lives of minoritized um, people, then you're not doing intersectional health research. Um, I think that's really important to emphasize. Um, and so in terms of a synthesis, one way that I have tried to synthesize intersectionality with a socio-ecological model um, and minority stress is to construct a model where intersectionality is represented at the top. And you can see it's not just the micro identities that are named in this fan type of shape, it's also recognizing how these identities combine to be at the core of the convergence of them. And then to, rec to reflect in the model that intersectional identities and experiences are filtered through social power structures. And there's going to be some sort of net stigmatization or lack thereof that um, stigmatization, if we're looking at more oppression um, that is you know, coming out of this. Um, and then how that filters through the socio-ecological model in terms of how do stigma and resilience promoting factors interact throughout a social network or a social system and society, et cetera, at different levels. And then how does that, um, the multi-level experience of stigma and resilience factors um, according to people's intersectional identities um, and the structural treatment of them um, relate to the stress that they experience? How does the stress they experience affect their health behaviors? How do their health behaviors and everything up in the top part of this model affect their health status? So this is an example of a synthesis of multiple forms of these theoretical models that are common in health research. So um, another synthesis that we see, I wanted to point out the work of Dr. Jay Sebelius and the gender affirmation framework. Um, Dr. Savellius had worked with transgender women of color and community organizations to develop this gender affirmation conceptual model that, as you see, ties in stigma um, to, you know, as, a, as through a social power system. So you can see social oppression here, and you can see how that is um, described across a series of identities that um, are described as working together intersectionally to affect the health of, in particular, Black transgender women was where this um, frame was focused for its implementation and meeting. Um, and then some other things, you see some common elements from minority stress theory uh, in terms of psychological distress being tied to social oppression. And then a resilience promoting factor, however, um, would be how much access people have to gender affirmation, meaning that they are affirmed for who they are at multiple levels as a black transgender woman is what this paper is about. Um, 
And then what you can see is that depending on how much gender affirmation and the need that people have for gender affirmation, gender affirmation is because of how stigma works in society, and then um, people's behavior is affected by that and their access to resources is affected by that. Um, because if you are multiply minoritized, uh, then you might have less access to employment as we've discussed already. You might be less able to negotiate if you are, um, you might be engaging in, um, if you're not having formal employment, you might be engaging in sex work for your primary income earning activities. And um, all of that can lead to differences in people's behavior that might put them at higher risk for things like HIV acquisition, which is really what this paper centers on. So this is an example of a synthesis that focused in on a multiply minoritized population, which also is something that would come from, you know, uh, be part of intersectionality's critical framing. Um, and that Dr. Boley has also written about in some of those papers I talked about earlier and um, applies it, you know, develops a conceptual model that is specific to that population and, and, and uses it to conduct the research study that's published in this paper that's cited below. So this right here is another example. Here's my synthesized model, but turned on its side. And rather than just being a general model that is kind of a social epi, you know, um, synthesis of different theoretical frameworks, it's applied to a certain health outcome. So here it's the focus is on cardiovascular disease and the health behaviors that I've centered that come from the minority stress model, for example, um, are centering in on cardiovascular disease and chronic disease risk factors. Um, so it's important to say that in addition to tailoring a conceptual model to a certain population, like we were talking about with gender, gender affirmation framework, you can tailor conceptual models to different health outcomes as well. So that leads us to a discussion of LGBTQIA plus research ethics. Um, I don't know if how many people in here may have taken city training. I can ask when we have our first in-person class uh, next week. But um, city training is really, uh, it's a type of training that you would take when you're trying to be able to be deemed an eligible personnel uh, member to be part of an IRB approved study. And the Belmont Report is at the heart of city training. It's a core foundational bioethical text. And there are three principles in the Belmont Report that are considered core to bioethics and medical ethics. And they are, include respect for persons, beneficence, and justice. Um, respect for persons really emphasizes autonomy as key. So people, all people should be treated as autonomous agents. Um, and also it means that people's diminished autonomy are entitled to protection. Beneficence literally just means do no harm. It also means that you should be maximizing possible benefits and minimizing possible harms when engaging in research um, with sexual and gender minority populations or any other populations for that matter. And then the third principle, justice, really wants us to focus on who receives benefits and who receives burdens. It also, I think, um, has a question that's embedded in it, which is who decides what is just? Who decides um, if the risk benefit ratio is enough to conduct the study? What if all of the risks fall in one group and all of the benefits fall in a different group? And what if the way that that maps falls along um, ways that might mean that dominant social groups are getting all the benefits while those who are minoritized get all the burdens? Is it an ethical study then? Um, you know, and, and who gets to make those calls? Who gets to see when those issues arise or not in terms of um, overall benefit, you know, risk benefit ratio versus kind of what if we focus in on and center in the margins, for example, which is a tenant from critical race theory, um, as well as in being embraced there for intersectionality from a critical frame as well. Like, what if we instead think about the benefits and the, and the risks that might accrue to Black transgender women if we think about um, the Sibelius model? Like you can see how picking conceptual models and theoretical frames to center your work can connect into these bioethical principles from the Belmont report. Um, and you can be thinking through how that might be affecting sexual and gender minority populations. I think Florence Ashley writes quite thoughtfully about this as an attorney bioethicist, um, and we'll be reading some of Florence Ashley's work actually in the next class period that gets at some of these questions. Um, so I already started to unpack this a little bit, but we need to apply the bioethical principles from this Belmont report 
and filter them through our theoretical conceptual models to think about how it might report to minorities, you know, apply to minoritized communities. Um, and I think one of the key things as you're thinking about stigma as a fundamental social determinant of health or the Goffman conceptualization of stigma and combining that with say intersectionality as a critical frame is, is to expand on this, this, this conversation of who decides not only what is just, but who decides what is stigmatizing. I would posit that from a critical frame that one thing that we should take away from this, this class hopefully is that people most impacted by stigma should decide what constitutes stigmatizing language and behavior. Um, people, again, as we know from Goffman, people who are not stigmatized often fail to see stigma where it actually exists. It's important to know as well that this also occurs among people who have, they've internalized high levels of self-stigma from the toxic culture um, that would tell them that they have a spoiled identity rather than seeing society as the problem um, and the poor treatment that society has against minoritized groups um, due to stigma. And in the context of the LGBTQIA health research context or sexual and gender minority health research context, it's important to say that SGM people or LGBTQIA plus people get to decide what is stigmatizing um, and we should be centering that in um, how to, you know, within how we do our work. So for that reason, it's really important to think about who's at the table when a research study is being planned. How are communities being involved um, in the conduct and the planning of the study? Are people, because um, there's the, the level, as we've discussed in the prior lecture, of, of you know, every person, every row of data is a life, um, and that when you had up the many rows together of people's lives that you form community experiences out of that. And so um, to some level, it's really important then that you are involving not just individuals on your research team with minoritized identities, but that you also invite in community stakeholders who know the stories of many people with these identities and can help um, spot stigma where it's existing within the conduct of SGM health research or other research with research with other minoritized populations and to think through this, not just one issue at a time, but to think through it um, at the intersections of um, the micro and the macro when it comes to race and racism, sex, you know, homophobia and gay identity, biphobia and bisexual identity, transgender identity and transphobia, et cetera. Um, I also wanted to meditate a little bit on the phrase, nothing about us without us. This phrase itself was popularized by disability rights activists in the 1980s. You can see the text and um, describing its foundations um, below in citation mode there. This is a theoretical model that really loops in sort of the community angle um, that combines this critical frame with the, the justice principle from the Belmont report to apply it to conducting bisexual health research in particular, the citation here. Um, and what's also really important about this model is not just who is involved in capturing community reality, being bisexual people, community stakeholders, and researchers, but that once you've captured the information, that you take action to advocate for health equity, um, and that the actions that are taken are done with community leadership. Um, and that's really also how we've designed this class to reflect that that must be, um, I think, best practices to do that for the, the reasons I was articulating earlier with the, at the bioethical frame, the critical frame, um, and how we know that stigma does in fact operate as a fundamental social determinant that affects health. So next I'm going to take us through a very brief and entirely inadequate overview of LGBTQIA plus history. Because part of the way that, that our knowledge of recognizing stigma gets passed down in communities is through our history. Um, and so given especially that it's Pride Month, I wanted to start off with the origins of Pride, including the Compton's Cafeteria Riots, the Stonewall Riots, and the Christopher Street Liberation March, i.e. the very first Pride Parade. So the Compton's Cafeteria Riots occurred in 1966 in August in California. The Stonewall Riots occurred um, in New York in 1969, three years later, the opposite coast. Um, but what they have in common is that they were reactions to police brutality in which com the community in particular, um, often transgender women of color, uh, were fighting back against police oppression and violence to claim that, you know, a place within society um, that 
really that, you know, obviously being um, LGBTQIA+, especially decades ago, was even more stigmatized than it is now, at least although it's an arguable contention these days. Um, and uh, people simply said, no, the community said, no, we are no longer going to take the violence that we are receiving from police and from the state, we're going to push back and protest and we are literally going to riot to take back and claim our, our rights. And so that is what kicked off Pride. Um, and then Christopher Street Liberation Day March was one year following the Stonewall riots. Um, and it was led by Brenda Howard, the mother of Pride, who is a bisexual, kinky, polyamorous um, woman who worked as a sex worker at times and um, was basically a radical, if you will. Um, she organized the first Pride Parade, which was that Christopher Street Liberation Day March. And I think it's important that we center the origins of Pride uh, as protest and, and specifically protest in reaction to police violence and oppression of um, queer people, especially those of color. Um, and some summary from this is that the origins of pride and resistance were really led by black and brown transgender women, bisexual people, sex workers, kinky people, polyamorous people in opposition, in opposition to intersectional oppression, including racism, gender-based harassment and violence, transphobia, biphobia, homophobia, misogyny, classism, anti-sex worker, stigma, police violence, all of that. And that is what led people to rise up and to resist the oppression that they were experiencing um, throughout society and at the hands of the state. Um, similarly, another, so another major kind of seminal moment in queer history, if you will, was the reaction against the AIDS epidemic that again was led by community activists. Um, HIV activists, really um, many of whom were LGBTQIA plus people because again, the HIV epidemic has had a disproportionate impact, especially um, against gay and bisexual men, especially those of color, as well as to transgender people, again, especially those of color. Um, and these were the groups that pushed the government to change the law. Um, so prior to the HIV epidemic, the FDA did not have a fast track approval process. And activists, especially those in ACT UP and other um, coalitions that were trying to demand the government act, act and recognize that the HIV epidemic was killing millions and millions of people. Um, they got the FDA to add a fast track approval process so that as drugs were discovered to have efficacy that they could get out to people who needed them so that they, you know, to stop the deaths that were acutely impacting the community at that time. Um, and you can also see that um, in this, you know, that they've changed the HIV activist community, even changed the way the National Institutes of Health gives out research dollars. The NIH is now has AIDS deadlines and then every other deadlines for submitting research funding applications. The reason that is true is because of the efforts of LGBTQI plus communities and HIV activists in particular. Um, I think everyone knows that in 2015, the Supreme Court during Pride Month um, there was a landmark ruling that resulted in the legalization of same-sex marriage across the entire nation. And then now, I mean, all of these, there are various issues at play, but I think um, the struggle for um, trend, you know, to the struggle that we have in terms of the violence, the systemic violence that, that is impacting Black transgender women um, and the high murder rate as well um, as again, police violence um, are key as key organizing um, issues that people are, are addressing now in the movement. There's also the, just the larger movement for health. There's movements um, to protect transgender youth. There's bisexual movements, asexual movements, intersex movements. I mean, there's, well, we'll talk about many of these movements and what the current moment has been for LGBTQI health um, and what is our current history that's being written in these movements? So um, why do I wanna go back and forth between the history and research ethics and these conceptual models? Um, that's because going back and forth and, and bouncing back and forth uh, from these different domains and the different social factors that influence them 
is the is what happens in SGM health. Um, one thing that in the health research context that always is going to come up and kind of, I would say, opposition to some of these critical frames is the medical model. The medical model classically would, would emphasize the objectivity of science and medicine. Um, it would say that who decides what is just is not to be discussed because it doesn't matter because science is objective, medicine is objective, right? Um, and that's why I would say it lacks a critical view. Um, the medical model also um, in its positioning of decision-making from the medical model as, a, as reflecting objectivity, pathologizes difference oftentimes as illness. So no, the medical team isn't stigmatizing the patient. The patient is just sick. Well, what's wrong with the patient? Well, under the DSM, from the old DSM, um, their diagnosis is homosexuality. Okay, <laughs> homosexuality is an illness or is it, you know, so again, like the medical model um, has the power to even define what is sick and healthy, what is sane and insane, what is sick versus um, well. And that's a lot of power that gets put into the hands of the medical system of the health system. Um, and I would think that some of the examples that I gave here, you know, homosexuality, biphobia, you know, homosexuality, bisexuality, um, being transgender, all of these things um, have been declared mental illnesses. Um, and if you look at intersex people, the conditions like Klinefelter's or Turner syndrome or androgen, androgen and sensitivity system, uh, or sorry, androgen and sensitivity syndrome have all been declared to be illnesses under the medical model. But are they illnesses or are they just another way of being that is being stigmatized by society that medicine has decided to co-opt that and say instead of stigma, it's sickness. So I think that's something that as you are doing SGM health research or as you're a clinician that's seeking to serve patients that you must keep in mind the social power of medicine to pathologize the minoritized and this is a um, quote that I think I was just paraphrasing a second ago by Susan Stryker out of the book, Transgender History, and that we're gonna end on here, which says medical practitioners and institutions have the social power to determine what is considered sick or healthy, normal or pathological, sane or insane, and thus often to transform potentially neutral forms of human difference into unjust and oppressive social hierarchies. And what we know from doing empirical research is that when that happens, that when medicine pathologizes, it often reflects stigma as a fundamental social determinant of health. And in that way, medicine um, has the power to potentially exacerbate social inequities in, this, in the name of medicine, or we can make a different choice. And we can instead adopt a critical frame and think through some of these conceptual models that we've discussed earlier at the beginning of this talk and say, in fact, we're going to approach medicine and SGM health research differently. And rather than having medicine and healthcare be something that perpetuates disparities, it can be a tool that we can actually do the opposite and promote health equity. But to do that requires a thoughtful interrogation and you should know your values and think about how you, as somebody who is going to be an SGM health um, change agent through the conduct in this course, how do you want to show up? I would urge you to think through what the answer to that is for yourself and think about how you will show up for your, in terms of yourself and as a team member in the class as we move through our group projects. Thank you.